Hey guys, and welcome to another show and tell video from Legacy Collectibles. Now, today is a first because I've done 150 videos, and if you go back and look over all my thumbnails, you won't see a single modern gun. I don't think you'll see a single modern gun. This is the first time I've had a modern, this is a semi-automatic shotgun. Uh, first time I've ever featured one, uh, and we have other guns to go over, so don't turn away. I still have some collectible handguns for you to see. Uh, but let's tell the story of this gun, the Spaz 15. It's actually a, uh, you can see right here, a Franke, uh, made in Italy, Franke Spaz 15, semi-automatic shotgun, but it's also uh, quite famous for being uh, dual actions. Uh, I'll show you that first and foremost. Uh, this is semi-automatic. And all you do is push this button and it becomes a pump shotgun. So from pump, very easily, go to semi-automatic. Why, why is that a cool feature? Well, let me tell you a little story about this gun. All right, I already alluded to the fact that I really don't pay much attention to modern firearms. Nothing against people who collect those. It's just not my clientele and not what I've studied most of my life. Uh, so when this walked in the door, I didn't pay any attention to it. We set it against the radiator. The day it came in, a collector also came in to pick up their 1941 Johnson rifle. And when they came in to pick it up, they saw this uh, sitting against the radiator and say, where the heck did that come from? So my ears perked up um, and he was enamored with the fact that it's so rare. Uh, we named our price and he paid it on the spot. Uh, so that made me even more curious and I decided to look into this shotgun and I can tell you why this is collectible. So this uh, unique select action uh, actually uh, was uh, featured in the Franke 12, uh, and that was a very popular semi-automatic shotgun with the dual action, uh, and it sold to a lot of uh, police forces, law enforcement agencies, but also to the general public. Um, so the 15 is supposed to be an improvement over the 12, and I'm told that it's a little bit cheaper, at least it was a little cheaper to make, it's not cheaper now, because it has a stamped receiver, it has some other parts uh, that are a little bit more improved, a little cheaper to make. Uh, it also includes a box mag rather than a tubular mag, uh, and this actually holds less rounds, a maximum of six, but it's a lot easier to pop in and out than the other magazine. I've not ever held a Spaz 12, so I can't say for sure, but um, people who do handle these, tell me that it's a lot uh, easier for police enforcement to pop the magazines in and out. Now let's talk about the select action feature. So I already told the story about how this walked in the door. And again, it's a, it's a walk-in Wednesday. You never know what's going to walk in the door. And, and I, I'm excited to get it because it gives me the opportunity to learn something new. And that, that's what happened here. When one of my younger employees who enjoys the uh, modern firearms, I, I was showing him, okay, you have the auto feature, semi-auto feature. Not full auto, by the way. Uh, they do make those, but this is a semi-auto and a pump. Why would you have a pump feature if you can just do semi-automatic, which basically means every time I pull the trigger, a shotgun shell will go out up to six rounds. Um, why do you need the pump feature? I, of course, had to turn to Ian at Forgotten Weapons and uh, watch the video that he did, and it makes perfect sense. Again, these went to law enforcement agencies. The pump action, is for less than lethal rounds. So as a law enforcement officer, there's a time when you might want to use a bean bag or a rubber bullet with a smaller load uh, in, in order not to kill somebody, but to slow them down, stop them, or injure them. The pump action is needed because the lighter loads don't provide enough recoil to chamber the next round. So that's why they have the pump action. Let me demonstrate this uh, really quickly and then we'll show you a video of somebody shooting this. Uh, first, I'm going to pop the magazine out just because it makes it easier for me to demonstrate. So uh, when it's in pump uh, and we see that there is a safety here, I'll show you. Let's turn it this way. It's a little more awkward for me, but I'll turn it this way. It does have a grip safety, which is kind of nice. Uh, when you grip the handle, um, that releases the safety. And then this is also a fire and safety. Let's first try it in the pump mode. And let's see, let's put the, uh, the safety is on. Now notice when I pump it, the safety came off. So it's ready to go as soon as you pump it. Let's do that again. Put it on safe. 
pump it, and it goes it goes on to fire. So um, what I my understanding there is that the police are ready to go once it's pumped. If there's a shell in the chamber, you can still put it on safe, and it won't fire. Um, put it on fire, and there it goes. And as soon as you fire it, it goes back to safe. Pump it again. Fire it, it goes to safe. Pump it. Fire. Pump it. Fire. So that's obviously pump action. Now, when I put it in auto, you have to read upside down, put it on auto. For the semi-automatic to work, uh, just like any other rifle, assault rifle, chamber around and fire. And then, of course, once you fire, then it automatically chambers the next round and works in semi-automatic. I hope that explanation makes uh, sense. Of course, it's a 12 gauge shotgun. As you can see here, uh, Franke, I believe that's the way it's pronounced, Boz 15, easy to see. It is made in Italy. That is very, very faint, so you can barely see it. Uh, now, what's important about that, these were made in 1986. They were first made in 1986. And by the time police forces started to test them out and put in orders, only 180 were imported into the United States before they shut down the import of these guns. And that is because in 1994, they passed the assault rifle ban and they stopped the import of anything that was considered an assault rifle. And there's several features about this gun that make it an assault rifle. So they banned it in 1994. So only 100 and about 180 came into the country, uh, which is why these are so rare and so collectible. But then in 2004, the assault rifle ban was lifted. Uh, so now these were importable, but they stopped production in, around that same time. They stopped production because Beretta bought out the factory, bought out the, uh, the brand, and they had their own um, semi-auto assault rifle that they were marketing. And therefore, the Spaz 15 was never um, reintroduced to the United States. So uh, that's why this collector came in and recognized the rifle and just had to have it. Now, if you search for one online, there's very few of them seen. I, I do see them on, I have seen them on Rock Island and they sell anywhere from $6,000 to $8,000. So that gives you an idea of the value of one of these Spaz 15s. I found this on YouTube of a, a, a somebody shooting one of these in semi-automatic and then in pump action. So you can kind of see how the shotgun functions. Firing the Spaz 15 is an awesome experience and shines light on that it is an evolved Spaz 12, not just a new gun. Everything feels tighter and functions a little smoother. Switching over to pump mode is done the same as the Spaz 12, only the selector button has been moved to the top of the action sleeve. The shortened action sleeve makes for a far reach forward, but the pump action itself is far and away smoother than the Spaz 12. Okay, next, and definitely a lot less sexy than the Spaz. Um, I've got some odds and ends. Actually, some of this came from Europe and some of it came from the United States. But the good news is I'm especially doing this for some of our European friends. Uh, actually, anybody overseas who has a hard time buying weapons. And my heart and sympathies go out to you Brits. Uh, you constantly write to me and say how much you like looking at guns. But uh, these are things that you can actually own. I got some holsters that I want to show you. And then this box. Uh, this actually came with a gun, but it didn't match. So I'd, I'd rather just sell the gun by itself. Uh, this, this box is numbered here. Uh, this is an original. Uh, it's actually from 1938 or 39, a PP box with the embossed gold uh, cover. This is without the signal indicator pin. And here is the serial number for a, a 32 caliber 7.65. So this is just the box. Um, and inside, so this is in remarkable condition. I'm going to be offering this for $400. If you want to just write in, this is something that I can do online because it's a, a non-forbidden item, but this is just an original box from 1938, and even the Brits can own this. You cannot stab anybody with this box, nor hit them over the head and hurt them in any way. Uh, here is an original manual. Uh, the back of the manual, you'll have to look up close, but you can see April of 39. Um, so the gun is about 38. Uh, the original manual is from 39. Let me turn this way. Uh, you can see what's in the original manual. Oh, there's one. There's a picture of a PP with the box mag. That's kind of cool. Actually, that's a PPK. Forgive me. There's a box mag on a, on a PP and a box mag on a PPK. That's the radon front sight. Uh, very cool. So uh, it's just 
a very neat manual. Uh, we have some of the holsters here, uh, Aka holsters, a shoulder holster. This is what the Walther uh, factory recommended in terms of uh, accessories, and this is, a, this is a parts list. And it says in here, if you want to get your gun fixed, you can send it back to the factory, and they'll, they'll uh, fix it with original Walther parts. Uh, but let's take what else is in the box. Again, if you want this, uh, just email us. So you can figure out how to find us. Um, but the sum of the parts, so this is the original cleaning rod. Uh, this is intact. Usually these are uh, gone. Uh, they just break off. The gun obviously goes in here. This is the tin. And then there's room here for an extra magazine. Uh, what I, uh, let me just show you inside the tin. Um, I've shown you this before. This is for cleaning the bore. Um, and you put this through the cleaning rod here. We also have the original rag that came. I've seen a lot of these, and this is the original rag that comes with it. Oh, this is the earlier variation, which actually has a picture of the factory on the lid. Uh, this is a tin, uh, made of tin. Uh, the later one just has a, a Walther banner on it. But most importantly, see that? There's some original oil. Original oil from 1938. Uh, comes with this at no extra charge. So the sum of the parts, just if you're, if you're uh, looking to buy something like this, we sell the, uh, the cleaning rod is about $100. Uh, the manual is about $150. Uh, these sell for about $150 to $200. And then the box itself, uh, in this case, we're offering it all for $400 uh, plus shipping. So let us know if you're interested. Okay, again, for you uh, Europeans and especially the Brits, you cannot hurt anybody with this holster. Um, this is one of the rarest holsters that we've ever offered, um, and actually I'm not sure I'm going to offer it, but I want to show it to you. I, it's, I, I just, these never come in. Uh, in fact, of all the uh, rare holsters that we have, such as the Party Leader, here's a picture of the Party Leader. We have offered those for sale on our website, um, and we've also offered the SA. Uh, let me find one of those. Here is the SA. That's the SA logo right here in a circle. You'll also notice that on these holsters, they're squared off, and that's so you can see the logo. Party Leader has the same squared off uh, closure strap. And the NSFK, uh, we have those on the site. They have the squared off closure strap. Um, and by the way, the, the, over time, these markings, they were probably stronger, but over time, they kind of lift off of the leather. Uh, the SA, we have these uh, fairly often. So Party Leader, SA, the rarer are the NSFK, uh, which was the forerunner to the Luftwaffe. Uh, there's a picture of that holster. And the rarest of all, by far, and I've only, I think I've only handled three of these in my life. Um, you can barely see it, but here's... The, um, you can see the brass stud, so this one's kind of early. Uh, they're in black. Um, they're marked Walther PP inside. Uh, this is beautiful, beautiful leather. They're all Aka marked. All of these uh, Party Leader and the SA, they're made by Aka, and that's, uh, that's the logo. But the most important part is you can see uh, that is the NSKK. Here, here's the actual logo. You can see it more clearly. Uh, NSKK, I did a whole video on it, but that was the uh, transportation core. You know, motorcycle with the sidecar and other, um, you know, uh, couriers and things like that. They also were the limo drivers for the party dignitaries. But this is the eagle for the NSKK. And there's a little banner here that says NSKK. This is by far the rarest of the Aka. These were actually commissioned uh, by the Nazi party as uh, special presentation holsters that went with the gun. Uh, this goes with an NSKK PP. Uh, actually, here's a picture of an NSKK. I don't have one currently, but we do get them from time to time. It has the NSKK marking, and this is the holster that go with it. Now, an idea on price. I see these holsters, uh, party leaders' holsters uh, often will go from uh, 2,500 to 4,500. I've seen these in the 6,000 range, um, and it's something that I'm not ready to let go of yet. This is an Aka holster. Looks just like all the us, other Aka holsters that we've seen, except it's not marked Aka. This is actually quite rare uh, because it is uh, where the Aka mark would go. This one was made by Aka but sold to the military, and this is often 100 stamped. So this is a uh, military holster for your military PPK. There's some writing here, but I can't quite make it out. 
Uh, probably somebody just ink stamped their name into it, but again, this is a military marked Aka holster. This is considered a dropping holster, um, and it gets its name because of the style. Um, this actually, uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with the dropping part, but this belt loop will drop down into place. And uh, this one uh, is Luftwaffe, that's a Luftwaffe proof right here. You can barely see it, but it's the Luftwaffe Eagle II. And then right here, it says, uh, you can probably not read it, that's 7.65 7 and 9 millimeter. Uh, they made them uh, for the Luftwaffe in 7.65 and 9 millimeter, and this would go with a Walder PP. So this is also um, a, a very rare holster, and this just came in this week. This came from Europe. And then one other Luftwaffe holster. This is all black with black stitching. So right away, I think, aha, this is a Kriegoff holster. Uh, the Kriegoff holsters are not maker marked on the back, and they're not dated. They usually are to completely blank, but again, they're black with black stitching. And, and this one has the Luftwaffe proof, the L2 proof. Now that style of Luftwaffe Eagle is actually later. Uh, so this would probably go with a 1940 Krigoff or, or later. If this is something that you're interested in, uh, we are offering this and there is a tool that goes with it. It has a very faint uh, Krigoff stamp on it, but um, it's actually not, it's not struck well enough. I, I can see it under magnification. That's a, a late Luftwaffe stamp, and it came in this holster. So uh, this is available if somebody's interested, but again, it would be 1940 or older. It's kind of a, it's a very rare holster, actually. Since I showed you this uh, uh, SA holster, some of you notice there's a gun sticking out of it. So before I move on to other guns, let me just show you this, uh, because this is just an absolutely beautiful. Let me get out my uh, oily rag. Whenever I take it out of a holster, I want to wipe it down. You guys get a good look at it. Um, but this is in the uh, proper serial range for an SA. There's actually several SA groups, and this is Crown N. So this is about 1938. Uh, just look at the finish on that. Fire blue on the safety. Um, I'd, I'd rate this about a 99%. Comes with the finger extension magazine. Look at the condition of the magazine. In fact, if we, oh my gosh, look at the top of that. You, when you put the rounds in, it'll make a line there, and so most of your magazines will have a line. Here you go. This is a this is a more normal magazine. You can kind of see the wear mark, not the wear mark, but the wear mark uh, right here. This doesn't even have a wear mark, so I'm sure it uh, chambered around at some time. This is a Walder Banner uh, only, which is proper for 1938, and of course the most important part of an SA pistol would be the SA Group. So it's a SA Group Mitte. So that's a district in Germany, um, and they had their own SA Group, and these were ordered, probably only about 100 of them were ordered in 1938 for this Group Mitte. Okay, speaking of the NSKK, this is actually a presentation, a 22 rifle. It's a Model 1 Walther, Model 1 Walther 22 target uh, rifle. Not something you would think that you would give as a gift to a major on his birthday, but this, um, this was actually presented to Major Johannes Zuck. I'm going to tell you the story of how, uh, how this was presented, but first let me tell you the story of this rifle and what makes this rifle so unique. So when uh, we first got this, I actually picked it up at a gun show, and there's a uh, lot of information about the background and the story of this gun. Uh, we sold it almost immediately to a Walder collector, and when he got it, he sent us a picture, and this stock had just been broken off. It was, I, I can't even show you. Well, I'll show you, but I can't see. This was broken. I'm not going to tell you who the delivery service was, because Mitch, our driver, is the best, and I don't want to badmouth his company, but I, uh, <laughs> a certain delivery company broke this right in half. Uh, so the guy, of course, uh, we were both sickened by it. I sent it out to somebody who had it repaired, and it came back. It looked beautiful. So we called the guy up and said, hey, if you want to take another shot at it, we'll send it out to you. And he said, Let me, show me the pictures. We showed him the pictures. He said, looks great. Go ahead and send it. And you're not going to believe this, but we sent it the second time, same carrier. Mitch was not involved. <laughs> and it broke a second time right in half. So 
this is after two breaks, we got it back, everything looks perfect on it. I'm gonna send it out a third time, but I'm gonna use a different carrier and we're gonna bubble wrap the heck out of this. But anyway, that's not the story that you wanna hear. Let's take a look at the rifle a little bit. Uh, this is factory engraved Walther. I've shown you other engraved Walthers, but they were mostly PPs and PPKs, uh, Model 1. Uh, the action on this is, is very, very light. Uh, in other words, it just comes straight back, single shot. Oh, sorry, I lied. Uh, there's a small 22 long caliber magazine and feeds that way. Uh, nice smooth action. Uh, but what's a little bit more interesting about this one, it's presented in August of 1944. And this was presented um, to the head of the police training school. It's actually the police training school for the motor corps. So NSKK, uh, and that was uh, housed in Seoul. Now, the, the man who was in charge, Major Sook, this is his birthday. Um, so the person who did the research um, uh, actually went back and, and looked at all the officers and their birthdays, and he's the only one that this could have been presented to. And it was actually on his 77th birthday. Let me show you a little bit about the research. This is the, uh, the, the dossier that he put together. It said he celebrated his 37th birthday, but actually we looked up the year he was born. And if you look at his picture, you can tell he was not 37. He was actually 77 in 1944. So this, this was a uh, typo. Uh, just uh, some of the background on Johannes Suk. Uh, he was actually in World War I, another reason he couldn't be 37. He was born in 1897 and he was a pilot, uh, flew a biplane in World War I and he was, uh, received some accommodation uh, in that regard. Um, that's the picture of him. Uh, this picture is from Oh, well, there's his date of birth right there. Uh, but this takes us all the way up to uh, 1943. You can see his SS. These were the different uh, assignments that he had. So he was in the SS. That's a police hat. So he was uh, a policeman, SS, and also NSKK. Uh, you can see Johannes Sook. Uh, he also went by the name Hans because here's a postcard he sent out in 1944. Hans Sook. Uh, there's his rank. Obersturmbannführer. Uh, I know the Germans get on me about my German. I am sorry. I, I should probably study this more, but I, I have too many guns to show you. Uh, so this postcard, here's the other side of the postcard. Don't you just love it? There's a Hitler stamp. So this postcard was sent out um, from, from him to a, a friend. It looks like a, um, an, a lieutenant in the SS, and we have a Hitler stamp. Uh, then there's um, just different documents about the uh, different assignments. Somebody went back and looked through the records and found all kinds of information about him. And he, uh, this is his actual handwriting, a letter that he wrote, his actual handwriting. So this is a great assembly uh, in, in spite of the broken stock. Hey, do you think I should try the same guy and sell it a third time to the same guy? Uh, there's his picture once again. Again, SS assignments and also police, uh, German police. I can at least read that much German, uh, Deutsche Polizei. Uh, last picture on the last page, there is Sook and some of the other instructors in the, again, this is the uh, transport motor, uh, motor police. Um, he was an instructor, he was the head instructor, Major Johannes Sook. Okay, talk about segues. We went from the NSKK to the NSKK training rifle, and now, we have a target 20, another Target 22. That was a German 22. This is a Colt uh, 22 caliber single shot. Looks like a revolver, but it's not. Let me show you what it is. This is a Camp Perry um, target pistol. Now, Camp Perry was famous for Camp Perry, Ohio. They had their national championship competitions, and there are um, Camp Perry 1911s. Uh, this was actually made in the 30s. Uh, they started making them in 1926, and they stopped uh, when World War I started uh, because they needed to put their energies into war production. Uh, but this is a Camp Perry. Looks like a revolver, but it's not. Let me show you the action on this. But, uh, the design and the action is very similar to the officer's model, the Colt officer's model. Uh, but you can see that the entire... The ent there, it's not a revolver because there's nothing that revolves. The entire assembly comes down. Uh, the serial number is right here, and it is 1373. They only made 2,000 of these. This is in 
incredible condition. So a Camp Perry 22, very rare gun, made 2000. And uh, you can see here, it's just single shot. But these are made for accuracy and for competition. Um, and um, this was on our website for a short period of time. It actually came with the manufacturer's information. And there's the target. Shot from Army Rest, Camp Perry, and it's dated 1933. How's that, how cool is that? I do think he needs to brush up a little bit. I see right here he hit the line. He should have gotten it all in the middle. But that's, that was shot in uh, June of 1933 at the Camp Perry uh, competition. Uh, this is the original box. And it's a tight fit, by the way. But it fits. And then the bottom right here is... Uh, numbered to the gun. Uh, so this is a, a very rare 22, actually something that I had never heard of until it walked in my door. I've got one more thing to t show you and um, I think you're going to be a little surprised by this. Does anybody know what this is? If you recognize this, well you know you'd probably say it's a landmine, but this is actually a bouncing Betty. It's um, a German S mine is what they called it. The GIs called it a bouncing Betty and it was greatly feared because um, like its name uh, implies, when you stepped on this, it, it uh, armed it, and then four seconds later, so in other words, you step on it, if you're, going, if you're going through the woods and you step on these tines, it needs 15 pounds of pressure. So if a squirrel goes on it or if a leaf or a branch has to be 15 pounds of pressure, push that down, engages uh, four seconds later, this flies up in the air, and it goes off about waist high. Um, as you can, and, and it's filled with ball bearings. These are the ball bearings. These are the ball bearings. And they are stacked around this canister. And it's designed that it explodes out, it explodes out horizontally. And so if you have troops uh, walking through a field, it's taking you out from the waist down. So basically it's designed to maim you, take out your legs and other crucial parts, but doesn't kill you, not from the chest or the head. Um, and because it would take two people to carry you off after you're uh, wounded. So it takes out, by taking out one guy, you actually take out three guys. Uh, so this was uh, greatly feared, a bouncing Betty. Um, and again, the Germans came up with it, this design in the 1930s and began to use them when they invaded France and they used them out throughout Russia. And as the Germans were retreating, uh, they, were, they were known for leaving these behind to slow down the GI advance. Um, now it came to, uh, all taken apart, so I, I'm going to show you a little bit about how this works. I know that uh, Ian likes to demonstrate, like he did the flamethrower, remember that? Uh, he did not demonstrate one of these, and I'm not going to either, but I am going to show you. Um, I figured out how to take it apart. So you'll see in this video that this all, all would be buried and only this top part. And I always watched in war movies where they're taking their knife and you can see them poking around. They're trying to find something metal. So they want to poke it down here, not up here. Um, and then they, they clean it all off around here. Now, when the Germans armed it, they would take this off after they buried it, and then walk away. Uh, that allows this to go down, and it's, it's, it's like a striker. It's, it strikes and starts the fuse. So when you step on it, it starts the fuse. Four seconds later, this whole thing pops out. This whole pops up, and inside this canister is the ball bearings and other other metal pieces uh, to act as shrapnel. And as I said, it goes up about three feet and then explodes. Uh, you, uh, you can unscrew the bottom of this and see the inner workings, uh, but I won't do that. Now, disarming it, which I always thought I, I'd never want that job, my, uh, disarming mines. Uh, but once you find it, what you can do is you could put just a metal, metal insert like if I, were, if I were going to disarm it, I'd put it like, right like that. That would keep this from depressing, almost like a safety. But even better, uh, you'll see them and they'll just take this and that's, that's the striker mechanism that lights the fuse. This just pops off. You can see, you can see where it hits. Whoops. 
Uh, you can see where it hits in here and that's what um, starts the fuse and causes this to pop up in the air and explode. So why in the world do I have this? Well, you remember I had the flamethrower and I said, I never asked for one, never looked for one. It just showed up at my door one day. Same thing with the bouncing Betty. Somebody said, do you want a bouncing Betty? And I thought, what am I gonna do with that? But actually the more I looked into it and studied it, I found it fascinating, read a lot about it online. Uh, a very um, fearful weapon. Uh, they did stop making them in 1944, but unfortunately other countries copied the design and they were used in Korea and all the way up to Vietnam. Hey, thanks for watching guys. You know, I always say you never know what's gonna show up here and we try to have a little bit for everybody, including people outside of the United States. Speaking of which, you know, we offered these puzzles and uh, one of the comments was, well, I can't, I can't do the German ones because there's, uh, there's swastikas. We redid the German one with no swastikas. We also won, made one for those red blood Americans. There's an American puzzle and a German puzzle, something for everybody. Now, one of the critiques people said, why in the world are you selling puzzles? I thought you sold high-end guns. Well, you know what? I can't win because whenever I put on the high-end guns, I get people saying, how come, I, uh, how come all you have is high-end guns? I can't afford anything. So we have, we have something for everybody. Just enjoy, enjoy the videos, they're free. If you wanna to go to our website that has non-forbidden items, that is Legacy YouTube, with a U, LegacyYouTube.com. And if you wanna to go to the forbidden items, you have to figure that out by yourself. No matter what, uh, we really appreciate you watching our channel. And stay tuned because I have a lot more really cool things coming your way.